everybody. It's Alex Gertruen uh, from the Home Rehab Network. Uh, today's topic, we have a couple topics. Uh, well, we have a couple things to kind of go over. Well, our exercise today will be on respiratory muscle training. So we just got this letter, so I'm going to just read it out. Okay. Uh, so this is off of the Center Disease Control, CDC. The CDC is saying that the, um, there is a huge outbreak that's, well, I'll just read it off, okay, and then I'll kind of explain as, I, as we go along. So, Canada Aris, a rare and sometimes deadly fungal disease, is spreading throughout the United States. The Center of Disease Control and Prevention warned this week, citing a dramatic increase in cases. According to the CDC, Canada Aris is a type of yeast that causes severe illness in hospitalized patients. It primarily affects older people with those with weakened immune systems. Reject, uh, so it also rejects treatments from traditional antifungal medications and has a mortality rate of up to 60%. That's quite alarming, actually, to be honest. Uh, there were at least 2,377 confirmed cases in the United States in 2022, according to the CDC statistics. That total was a steep jump from 1,474 cases in 2021, and it continued a rapid increase in 2020. So we understand that environmental exposures play uh, a, a very big um, a big role when it comes to people with uh, immunocompromised diseases like COPD, uh, you know, uh, heart disease, any anything that can cause. Basically, saying uh, when you look at fungus, you look at pollen, you look at mold, fungi, uh, you know, uh, from any any type of organism really, but it's specifically mold. Mold, you can obviously see if it's on a surface sometimes. But there are a lot of times where mold, you cannot see it. There can be in your ductwork, like I stated many, many, many times. Um, my, just as one, one, like one incident, my own mother actually did a mold test because I told her to do a mold test because she was getting all these allergies. And she was having heightening of allergies, like just intense amounts. So I had her do a mold test and she found there was, there was mold built up in her ductwork. Uh, when she did the mold test, she put, just put it on the ground as according to the manufacturer's instructions. But she was surprised. She was like, there is no mold. I says, well, let's take a camera and scope out the ductwork and see if there's anything there. I saw something, and then I had a specialist uh, air conditioning people come out to scope the camera, and they did see, yes, there was mold buildup. And it was a very small little bit of it. Okay, for Everyone should know how things spread. When something spreads fast, like remember COVID, of course, right? When they spread fast, it only takes one to cause it. It just takes one. This is 1,700. This is 2,700 now. That's, that's, all you need is one person to cause an outbreak. Okay, I'm not trying to alarm anybody, but that's what the CDC is stating, and I have to, as a clinician, recite exactly what is, what's kind of like what's happening. Okay, um, on our first exercise that we're going to be doing, I'm still going to go over kind of a little bit about this, but uh, let's talk, uh, let's actually do some respiratory muscle training. If you have a tie, a scarf, a towel that, uh, like a uh, dowel that can at least wrap around your torso, okay, I'm using here a therapy band. So when I use a therapy band, I'll just put behind underneath my arms. I'll pull some tension and I'll breathe in really deep. The point on respiratory muscle training is to increase what? What are we increasing? What are we trying to increase when we do that? Does anybody remember? You can write in the, hey, Michael, you can write in the comment section. I'll be happy to address that, uh, any questions or anything like that. So what I'm doing respiratory muscle training, how do I know I'm doing full repetition versus partial repetition? And what, what, what am I talking about when I say that? So let's say I have a regular weight for my bicep and I'm curling it, okay? That's gonna, like, doing this much curl instead of full repetition, it's not gonna work out really well from this bicep, right? 
Same thing with breathing. So how do I know I'm doing full repetition with breathing? Like, how do I know? So if I'm doing full repetition with breathing, I'll breathe in. Exhale all the way out. Now, how deep do you breathe in to provide full reps? Because if I breathe in too shallow, I might be doing partial repetition, right? So I want to make sure that I'm doing full repetition. All right, so I do this, pull some tension. Now, I'm not going to tie this into a knot. Let's say I want to do respiratory muscle training. I'll tie. I mean, I won't tie. I'll just pull and pull, like, keeping a lot of tension there. Not a tremendous, uh, tremendous amount of tension, but some tension. You know, like this would be too loose, right? So... And you don't have to have a therapy band to do this. You can use a tie, a dish towel, um, you know, any, anything that can wrap around your torso and you'll hold it, providing tension with your arms or by using, if you la use an elastic band, you're using the resistance off the elastic band to provide tension. Okay, so I provide tension and I breathe in, providing full repetition for the respiratory muscles. I'll breathe in as deep as I can. Filling up my lungs to what? 100%, right? Filling it up all the way. Then exhaling all the way out. Breathe back in. Try to keep adding more air, even though it feels like nothing else is coming in. Keep adding, keep adding, keep adding. Then exhale. Breathe all the way out, all the way out, all the way out, all the way out, and then breathe back in. Nice and deep, nice and deep, nice and deep, nice and deep, and exhale. Okay. When I'm doing this, I'll do this about six times a day, 10 minutes each, until my volumes uh, are increasing. But remember, there, are, there is a, a few things to understand here. Once you get your lungs working the way you want them to work, very compliant, they're, uh, you know, they're not so dense, those lungs are so dense, uh, you have plenty of muscle to do the respiratory muscle training. You have plenty of muscle to breathe in really deep. Okay. Any, uh, once you get that, those lungs to be fixed up, you still might have the issue of being winded when you work out because being winded is not a disease, but some people feel like it is. Okay. Like, oh, I was never this went out of breath. Well, when was the last time you worked out? Well, it's been in some years, you know, it's been a few months or it's been like six months or something like that. I mean, you could be out of breath because you're out of shape. You know, um, you, your muscles could be very weak, and you could be out of breath just by standing up and walking. You could be anxious now. Good morning. You can be anxious, and your brain's going to be consuming a heck of a lot more oxygen than your than the rest of your body sometimes, right? <laughs> you know, that's why that's the problem with anxiety. The brain consumes more because it's exercising in a sense, uh, not in a good way, just overreacting, right? Okay. All right, so we were talking about mold and fungi. Uh, so what I'm going to, so on, for those who just kind of joined us, I'm going to reiterate just a few things, okay? And for those that don't know, my name is Alex Gertuin. Uh I'm a registered respiratory therapist. I'm the director for uh, pulmonary uh, rehabilitation. I work with advanced lung and heart disease. Um, and, of course, welcome. If you haven't been well with us yet, Welcome to our twice weekly live stream at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Tuesdays and Thursdays, here on the Facebook and YouTube channel pages. For those who do not know, we stream on both platforms. So if you'd like to be notified uh, of the next stream or watch a reply, uh, I'm sorry, a replay for later, then the link in the description of the post or in the comment section if you would like to follow us on both YouTube and Facebook page. We would highly suggest following us by clicking on the picture on YouTube, just following us on YouTube. Okay, and right now Sonia's going to gather the link where you can just easily click on it so you can follow us on YouTube. Okay. I'm just going to wait for her to post that really quick just so you have that. There's one more moment there. And you can easily just go on to, yeah, just go on to YouTube. But there's the link right there if you see that on the comment section. Okay. All right. 
So uh, I was talking about, so I, I was talking about something the CDC kind of sent out. So uh, what we're going to be going over today, today we're going to be going over and what's new in the news. What's the, you know, what's kind of going on. So today, can you scroll back down? Okay. So, so today we'll be discussing a crucial topic that is making headlines lately. Uh, the alarming increase in deadly fungal infections and how it's affecting individuals with COPD or other lung conditions. Now, this is specifically the CDCD state stated that the um, people with immunocompromised, and that includes, of course, people with COPD. So we'll be drawing insights from a recent article published on the Yahoo News, which you can find by Googling CDC warns of dramatic increase of deadly fungus. So if you just type that in on Google, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, I'll also share a link in the comments, so let's just go ahead and dive in. According to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, there's been a dramatic rise in life-threatening fungal infections in the United States, and this is especially concerning for those with COPD or other lung conditions. The main culprit behind these infections is called the Candice Aris. Research found a total of 3,270 clinical cases and 7,413 screening cases of C. aris in the U.S. till the 31st of December 2021. The percentage increase in clinical cases grew each year from a 44% increase in 2019 to a 95% increase in 2021, and that's what the, the paper actually stated. 17 U.S. states identified for the first C. aris case from uh, 2019 to 2021. These findings highlight the need for improved detection and infection control practices to prevent spread of C. aris, the paper said. Candid uh, aris is among the kind of yeast commonly found in the environment, but can become a severe problem for people with uh, weakened immune systems, including those with COPD or lung disease. When inhaled, Canda aris spores can cause a serious infection, a, da a dangerous condition that is that if, when not responded to a typical traditional antifungal treatment, can have a 60% mortality rate. So what can be done about this? Prevention is the better than basically being prevented and being prophylactic, but prevention is better than the cure. So here are some tips to reduce your risk of exposure to dangerous fungal infections. Reduce your time in hospital environments. It's easier said, uh, spread in hospital care facilities, they found. So going inside facilities, immunocompromised people have the possibility of nosocomial infections, especially with this type. Nosocomial mean, meaning that you obtain a pathogen, in a sense, inside of a facility. So keep your living environment clean and free of mold and dust. Use a HEPA air purifier to filter out airborne spores. Practice good hygiene, including hand washing and avoiding contact with moldy materials. Take your COPD or lung condition medication as prescribed to keep your condition under control and maintain a strong immune system. Respiratory muscle training. Now, we're talking about respiratory muscle training. Um, Respiratory muscle training can be done with a scarf. Of course, we always use Delta V's. This is a Delta V. Okay. How we use a Delta V. Another easy way to understand how a Delta V works, even though it's pretty simple to understand, you just set a good resistance that you're feeling resistance. You breathe in as deep as you can. You exhale all the way out. That's, it's not that complicated. But there are some tips and tricks with these. If you want to manage flow rate, you attach this to an incentive spirometer. If you want to understand something really simple about these numbers, because it's numbers from 0 to 7. So numbers from 0 to 7. Uh, if I have this set to a 1, the, so the big arrow points at the 1, that means I should be able to inhale a full volume in one second. Like so. There you go. If this is set to a 4, if I set it to a 4, I should be able to breathe in a full volume in four seconds. Okay, all right. If I have this set to a six, you guessed it, I should be able to fill up my lungs 100% in six seconds. If it took me eight seconds, 
if it took me 12 seconds. That means the resistance might be too heavy and it's too tough to try to breathe in in six seconds through a setting of six. So if I do this, right now this is at a six, by the way. Okay, if it took longer, like you're, you have your set at a six and you use a, a stopwatch and you're finding that it's taking you 10 seconds, it's taking you 12 seconds to fill up your lungs all the way. That means the weight is too heavy. Then I would lower the weight down back to a, maybe down to a five from a six. A seven, of course, I should be able to fill up my lungs in seven seconds. Okay, respiratory muscle training. This is the one use device that we use all the, th this is all we use. We, we use that device for respiratory muscle training. We use VPEPs from, by Dr. Burton. We use those for flutter valves, you know. Uh, there's a lot of name brand things out there, but the, we could have easily went with something super, in, super expensive. You know, like uh, we can go with something uh, and at like an Arabica that's like a hundred bucks. But no, we went with something that can do the same trick, dishwasher safe, easy to clean, very easy to manage, high quality with half the price. That's why a lot of these devices, like you have things called like the breather. You know, $60, $70, depending on which type you get. Half the price. We have therapy bands. Sure, we can grab some of the most expensive therapy bands there is, but $3. You know, we're not, this program is not made to make money off products. That's not what it does. We, 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 we don't do that. We strive on doing virtual pulmonary and cardiac rehab, right? That's, we don't strive, we do a one heck of a job with pulmonary and cardiac rehabilitation. In fact, we had one senator from Florida actually uh, email me uh, wanting to chat. And he's been uh, the senator over in Florida. I, don't, I just got the email last night, so I'm, uh, I guess he wants to have a chat about what we do and things like that just because in each state, uh, like we looked at Maryland, we did a white paper study, and the hospital drop in hospital readmission rates was so dramatic, meaning we successfully dropped hospital readmission rates, meaning people that have a tendency of going back and forth to the hospital, we dropped that number down, all the way down to 2.4%, which is phenomenal, excellent. And we were able to do that with our virtual program. You know, and our virtual program, we have two types. We have the pulmonary and cardiac rehab by HRN that does it through Zoom, like FaceTime and Zoom, where we use your camera and we see you, you see us, we hear you, you hear us, we do therapy together. Then you have the Manu Lungs. Manu Lungs is not a telemedicine program, okay, at least not yet but it's not a telemedicine program. So it's recorded, pre-recorded, and it's self-paced, and you work it out based off of the therapies that are, are in every single week, okay? And I think maybe next time what I need to do is grab a screen, a big screen, and show you step-by-step -step of how to get into my, uh, to my new lungs and how to work it. Because there are things that people should be taking advantage, but I don't see them taking advantage as much. So on my new lungs, on the first week when you sign up, you get to see me. And you just make an appointment to see me. You don't pay for that. That's, that's part of the my new lungs. The first week on, like, I believe it was on a Friday or something, you know, but on the first week on your uh, fifth day in, it'll say make an appointment to see Alex. I'm Alex. Okay. So a lot of people aren't taking advantage of that. They'll just skip and go to the other classes but it's a great idea to actually talk to a clinician like me talk to a doctor like dr shaw talk to it's a great idea to get a peer review perspective you know like hey um this person said i should be doing this what do you think i'm taking this type of medication what do you think i have a bad hip i'm not sure if i can do that exercise what should i do in substitute just talk to a clinician to help yourself not a just an average Joe and Schmo, but somebody that actually takes the time 
to study you, to talk to you. You know, what's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. So we should be taking advantage of that, right? So on our next uh, live session, I want to kind of go over how to work out in Mind You Lungs, okay? How to set up your therapy room, how to set everything up. So then when it comes, when you go into class on Mind You Lungs, that's, that's for the people that are not in with HRN. But a lot of, uh, most of the people in HRN tend to go in Mind You Lungs also as a, because we, we recommend it. Because they, you know, in, my, in HRN, they do therapy Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So what are you doing Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday? You know? So they have extracurricular exercises they can do, and we usually see high results from that. I hope to get back in the program soon. No problem. Uh, but, yes, this is the elite program. If you're trying to get in the program, get in the program. But this program is the one that works insanely well, as you can see from a lot of people. We get... I had a lot of messages uh, this morning with people telling me that prior patients that were going up hills and going up. There was one, I don't know if I have it here. I should have brought it in. Um, but there was a, uh, one patient called me, said he was on top of the mountain. I was like, oh, my goodness, what happened? He says, no, 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 I climbed it. <laughs> and I was like, I was just, it was, uh, uh, I saw big mountains on the back. So it's either in Colorado or maybe, maybe Colorado, maybe Utah, uh, maybe Wyoming. But it was just an awesome sight to see a, somebody who had severe lung disease being able to climb mountains again, you know. And it's not like it's like cliffhanger with, you know, Sylvester Stallone hanging. Not that type of rock climbing. I'm just talking about going up a very steep hill and you have to really hike up that mountain, you know. So the hill is not this. <laughs> it's, it's more of a small, lower degree angle. Um, but... You know, the only way you can really feel better, because there's always a million reasons not to do something, the only way you can really feel better is if you try to help yourself out. There's always going to be a million reasons not to do something. So uh, I would suggest going into Mind You Lungs. It's insanely inexpensive, but we, we do have to keep, you know, the program running. So there is a small cost to it, but it's a very small cost. Just look up, if you get a chance, look up pulmonary rehab. And look at how much it costs to be in a traditional inpatient facility, not outpatient, inpatient. Because I was a director for a five-star facility, not a two- or three-star facility. I was, the, I was at a five-star facility. So it's the highest level. Not a one-star facility, not a two-star facility, but a five-star. And it was $372 per day. Yeah, so at the end of the month, it's about $20,000. Your mind you lungs is nowhere anything near that. HRN is nowhere anything near that, you know, because that's, you know, we, we understand that. People don't have that type of money, but it's the insurance that pays for that, right? But sometimes people, some people don't have the right insurance. They have the state-appointed insurance that gives them barely anything to help them with. And that's the fight we have all the time in here. We fight for everybody, you know, but sometimes what a great idea would be is going to your local senator, maybe emailing your, you know, uh, you can uh, email members of Congress and just letting them know that, hey, you need to cover pulmonary rehab for this. And, you know, for, you can just explain your frustrations. You can talk about what problems you're seeing and see there's a, always a resolution. There's always, a, like, if I had, let's say, if I had a senator in front of me right now, I'll be discussing things that are not off topic, but specifically based off of pulmonary and cardiac rehabilitation. Because Medicare, and it's not necessarily Medicare, but it was uh, some part of the government that were saying that in May 11th, they're gonna stop pulmonary and cardiac rehab and all virtual pulmonary and rehab. And that we, uh, uh, we talked to uh, some, po you know, some people at a higher level and uh, they said, I wouldn't worry about you. It's the other ones. But that also means if we're the only ones, we'll remain the only ones doing this job, which is providing virtual pulmonary and cardiac rehabilitation that's covered under insurance. So just by sending out a letter talking about, hey, there are a lot of people. There is 17.5 million people in the United States, if not more, that 
were diagnosed with COPD, but they have no pulmonary rehab to go to. That's an actual number. In cardiac, it's 70 million people in the United States, not world, in the United States. Some people have to travel 180 miles to get to a facility, and that facility is subpar because they go in a facility feeling the same way as they come out. And why do you think we're on live streams doing this, talking to you? Because we want you to understand facts. We want you to do the research on those facts, you know. But they're trying to get rid of the only thing that can keep you, a lot of these people alive. The one chance that we can get to improve somebody's outcomes is through pulmonary rehab. And you're, you're pausing. You're not joining in. You just keep wanting free stuff, free stuff. That's what a lot of people on YouTube want. You know, I'm not saying everybody. I'm just understand that they are about to get rid of pulmonary and cardiac rehab for each and every one of you. So what do we do? Do we just keep fighting or do we just say, ah, I die, I die? I mean, when did that begin? Anyways, when did we start like that? When, when did we act this way? So, of course, HRN is going to be around, and it's, uh, it's not falling down the cracks, but I'm also looking at all these other places that do a great job in pulmonary, and they're doing the virtual way as well, but they're, they're going to be pulled out, and they won't be covered anymore? That's alarming. I mean, before COVID, did you know there was 831 facilities that were certified in pulmonary and cardiac rehab in the United States? Only 831. Look at the American Thoracic Society in 2017 of May. The, you know they, they, they did that. You know they, they did that study. There was only 831 facilities. When COVID happened, less than 10% was left over. And now it looks like they're trying to get rid of all pulmonary and cardiac rehab. But they said HRN can stay because you know they, they have a lot of people. They do a really good job. But the thing is, what about we'll be the only ones? Where's everybody else's help? There's a lot of clinicians that want to help out. What? So we're just giving up on everybody now? Let's see. I was in your program, and now my insurance wants me to go to a facility in network, but my doctor di uh, did write a letter of necessity for HRN. HRN works better than any other program out there. That is a, that's a fact. We hold the highest success rate, so we, I, I understand what your, your doctor wants you to stay in HRN, doesn't want you to go into, inside a facility. That right there should tell you the HRN, its highest standards are always being met. We're so good at what we do. But these programs out there are dying left and right, not because of us. We're fighting for the cause because people can't travel to a facility because of gas, money, you know, other issues too. You know, they don't want, they don't want to get infections, you know. People go into hospitals because there's still a lot of people who are sick. A lot of people go into hospitals because they're dying. I mean, did you know that, for, uh, it was, they say it was something around 43%, 43, I want to say it was higher, but 43 was ju jumped in my head. So about 40, it was like something like 43% of the people that go to pharmacies to pick up the medications are sick. Sick. And you're going to a pharmacy to pick up your Advair, your other respiratory medication, the person coughing behind you could be spreading those. Like, there's a lot of reasons. That there's a lot of things happening, and pulmonary rehab specialists know what's going on. That's because that's all we ever do. You take us out of the mix, what do you have? You have a Joe and Schmo that thinks that, oh, physical therapy and, and other people that will do everything for pulmonary. No! No, because, I'm sorry, physical therapists don't learn four years and five years and six years in, in respiratory. They don't learn that. They learn physical therapy. We learn pulmonary. We learn respiratory therapy. We learn all that stuff, right? So would, would you go to some, like, if you have a heart problem, you don't go to a 7-Eleven and grab a cup of coffee and explain to the cashier what exactly you have. Of course not, because it's not the right person. It's completely ridiculous and insane, you know? They're trying to take respiratory, like pulmonary rehab out. I understand we're staying, but what about all those other people? Hi, Michelle. What about all those other clinicians? What about all these people that we're supposed to be taking care of? And most of these, uh, some of these people on Facebook and YouTube, no offense to anybody, are just waiting and waiting and waiting, and now the chance to be reborn and literally 
transform to somebody that's a better form of you, meaning getting your lungs back, getting your health back, getting yourself stronger, decreasing your anxiety is going down. Why? Because you're con people are constantly procrastinating, waiting, 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 and they only make, they only make this decision to, to actually do something about it when, all, when everything fails in their life. I can't walk. I can't move. I haven't been able to move for six months. I guess I need help. They wait until they're near dead to do something about it. And it's, it's the worst thing you could ever do. I'm literally trying to fight for you guys here. But uh, I, I just I couldn't believe that news when I saw that. I understand HRN is going to be alive forever. But what, those other, all those other clinicians and those doctors and respiratory therapists out there, they're just... I think you understand what I'm trying to say. They're getting pulled out completely. I mean, that's, it is horrible. So I'm working out a plan with Dr. Shaw um, for insurance, people that have problems with their insurance. Uh, unfortunately, we can't make this free because it's not a 501c3. There's no one that, f that will fund HRN. There's no government official you know, that will fund HRN, right? So um, there is something I'm working on with Dr. Shaw, and it's developing a virtual pulmonary and cardiac rehab program that's done through Mind You Lungs. HRN will always stay HRN. HRN is a virtual, uh, where it's in real time, you know, it's a, where we use your camera and your microphone on your whatever, smartphone, computer, tablet, whatever it is. And you see us, we see you, we do therapy together Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We're going to start initiating another program for those that don't have insurance, but we, there has to be a cost because you're not paying for the doctor. Try to pay a doctor out of pocket. It is nearly impossible unless you can fork out $700 an hour. I mean, it is insane. And I'm not talking about primary care doctor. I'm talking about pulmonologist. Okay? Try to get a pulmonologist with a couple bucks. They will laugh at you. So it is literally horrible, right? So uh, there has to be a cost. So we're working something like that out for all these people uh, that have no other place to go, you know. So, uh, this topic very much excites me, learn how to breathe. Thank you, D. <laughs> all right. Uh, Michelle Jones, my insurance is denying HRN for me now because they want me to go to facility. Uh, in the network, they make me angry. No worries, Michelle. We understand, uh, you know, but, I mean, all your insurance company has to do is literally look at the studied statistical paper that we, that no one can disprove. It's already been proven. And if they see, I mean, we should really just form like a ballot or something and I'll go to Congress. I mean, we, like, a lot of these insurance companies are just being ridiculous. It's just they, they're treating it too much of a business and not, not like they – I'm not saying all insurance. It's just they're treating it too much of a bit like a business. And it's – we're in healthcare. You know, this isn't a crashed motorcycle or car. You know, this is something that can be fixed, like, overnight. This is something that needs continuation, as a lot of these diseases are progressive diseases. So – we have to do something about this. At least I'm fighting. I'm one person that's constantly fighting for everybody, you know, and you have people at HRN that are fighting, you know, but maybe we got to take it upon ourselves to help spread the word in a sense, uh, not about HRN, but the necessity of pulmonary and cardiac rehab, you know. If we can shout out a bigger voice, and you, let's say you have a contact, you know, anything like that. Yeah, insurance companies think they're doctors. Well, I mean, there are a lot of doctors in insurance companies. I have to give them that, but you're right, D. A lot of uh, insurance companies just, uh, it's just a sad, it's kind of like almost like a sad world, but don't, don't feel that there's no hope in this. We will always stay. We will always help. It's just what's going to happen because until the day I die, I'm just always going to be that person. Hello from Sharon S. Walker. Does anybody have any questions? Write any comments, questions, anything like that? We can talk about the mold. We can talk about prevention. Go ahead and write in the comments section. But uh, 
I know I was in uh, in the program for a couple months, and now they was. You know, I've... Let's get off this topic, yeah, and t ask me a question. More than what's a question mark on it. Ask me a question. I'm not a biller. I'm not. I can't solve everyone's problems for financial problems. You know, I. Let's move on and, and go with a question. Anybody have a question with anything? I, I, I wish I, I'm not a biller. I, I went to school for, uh, for pulmonary, and, well, for respiratory therapy, and I went into pulmonary rehabilitation. But you're asking billing questions, and I, I don't know what to say about that. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I don't know what to say about, about that. So um, if you have questions in, in, in regards to pulmonary and cardiac or you have a question about a medication, like we had a lot of people that um, didn't realize that there were volume requirements to medications. Just because you inhale on a medication doesn't mean it's actually making it into your lungs for it to work. And some people, when they take it, they think, oh, no, it's working. I feel, and what they feel is a placebo, but it's not giving you any side effects. You know, um, we, uh, there was, you can ask, ask questions like that. But ask questions about when you walk a short distance and get out of breath. D, what do you mean out of breath? Like, what do you mean out of breath? Out of breath is like completely out of breath where you can't, you have to call 911? Or are you talking about increased work of breathing? Because that, to me, is very confusing, everybody. When you, somebody says, I walk and then I get out of breath, I don't know what you mean by that. Out of breath, to me, sounds like you need to be on a ventilator. Like, what do you mean out of breath? So let's use numbers. 10 being the worst, 0 being the least. How, D, how out of breath do you get when you walk? 10 being the worst. And did you justify those numbers? Did you justify your work of breathing with a number? We have to quantify things. So I can't say, oh, I'm out of breath. Well, 10 being the worst, 0 being the least, how out of breath would you say you are using a number? With 10 being the worst? He's like, yeah. I said, maybe a 5. Well, that's not out of breath. That's increased work of breathing, but still manageable. Yeah, but that's how I get. But people are thinking out of breath, meaning completely out of breath. That's why we don't like to use that here at HRN. Uh, do you have another exercise we can do? I mean, I, I go over exercises uh, uh, every time we, gum, we come in. I did talk about respiratory muscle training exercises. But why don't you go into My New Lungs and sign up on My New Lungs? If you sign up on My New Lungs, at least you can at least talk to somebody like me, and we can help you out with that. You know, so And you'll have a wide range of exercises you can participate in. I have a question about the Inspire product. I see that your BMI has to be lower to qualify. Who is that? Sharon, I have no idea what you mean by that. What Inspire device? I would need a little bit more. 9 and 10. So, D, you're saying that when you, you're at a 9 and 10, that, you know what a 10 is? Does anybody know a realistic 10? You couldn't be able to talk. You're on the ground, huffing, you, you're, just, you're just ventilating your, and you're just so diaphragmatic. I mean, you're like this. <laughs> And you're on the floor nearly passing out. You're saying when you walk a little bit, that's how bad it gets? I bet you anything, D, if you went into my class and you show me how out of breath you get by you walking and I'm watching you walk, I bet you you'll never be completely out of breath because I'll never allow you to get completely out of breath. Okay? Being out of breath is not a disease. Again, it's not a disease. What is it? It's a heightening of CO2. That's all it is. That means you're not ventilating. Right? If you come into my class, just come into my class. Just, that's all you have to do, D. Just call us up, come to my class, and I will go over with you. But I do not believe you're at a 9 and 10. I've seen 9 and 10s. I've seen 9 and 10. You're in the hospital, 9 and 10. Now, at least you pa or unless you passed out at home. 9 and 10 is the highest levels. Yeah, passed out. Exactly. Okay. Is there a medical device I can use to help exercise my lungs? Yes, again, 
Delta V's are the one devices, Mary, we use here. Delta V's. It's Delta V dot rehab. No dot com, no nothing else. It'll take you straight to the website. Delta V's is what we use here for respiratory muscle trainers. And even if, yes, with IPF, especially idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or fibrotic lung disease, um, Delta V's are the top ones. Because how do you think we got people to increase their abilities? Yes, Delta V's and plus a lot of the exercise and trainings we do. Um, I was using the Duo Nebulizer medication, medicine for my breathing treatments, and I take Spreva. Oh, no. Michelle. So a Duo Neb has ipotropium bromide. You're mixing with Spreva with just titropium bromide. So two backdoor inhalers will cause the opposite effect. It's completely contraindicated by the FDA. So um, whoever, I read that those counteract with each other. Is that true? Yes, Michelle, that it literally stated there. You cannot take two controllers like that back to back. Um, so, I mean, Spiriva by itself is a 24-hour drug. Duonebs are a four- to six-hour uh, drug. You're, you're taking them back to back. Even if you took one and you waited, you know, three hours, you have one that's a 24-hour drug that you're adding another ipotropium, you're adding a, a, an atropium bromide, this case ipotropium, not titropium bromide, which is Spiriva. Okay, so you're mixing them two up and you're going to get an adverse effect. Of course you will. Okay. Uh, D, low, delta V, yes. This is a delta V. If you go on to our Facebook group, delta V, our Facebook group, Delta V, just go on there. Just follow us on Delta V. Uh, we have a web page, the Delta V company is on there. So you can easily go on to Facebook and just type in Delta V, and there's a web page right there. Okay, if you want to try to get into Mind You Lungs, I'd highly recommend getting to Mind You Lungs. Don't mess with it. That is one program people use when they, have no, they, they don't have any insurance. And I tell you, it works tremendous. But you have to work the program out. Worst thing and it, some people can do is do their own thing. Like they try to get, oh, let me just pick up this magazine or this uh, exercise book. But you have to work out respiratory. You're, you're, not, you're supposed to work out your respiratory system before you work out your other muscle groups and things like that. Okay? Um, any other questions? We can talk about anything. Anybody else has have any questions? Okay, I quit using the Duonet. Very good. But remember, remember, you have to consult with your doctor. Make sure any time you change anything, always consult with your doctor at all times. Always consult with your doctor at all times. Okay. Remember, I'm not. I'm not even a doctor. I'm a respiratory therapist. I'm one of the Maryland Board of Physicians. You know, but I'm. I'm not. I don't have the MD. I have the RCP license. Respiratory Care Practitioner License under the Maryland Board of Physicians. So it's not an MD. I don't prescribe medications. I do therapies. Remember, I'm a therapist. I do pulmonary and cardiac rehab. A respiratory therapist and a pulmonary care specialist are two different types of entities. I am licensed to do everything a respiratory therapist can do because I am a respiratory therapist. But I am specifically with pulmonary rehabilitation. Respiratory, all the respiratory therapists that have never been in pulmonary rehab can't just do pulmonary rehab. So you shouldn't be going to a respiratory therapist unless they were experienced and they've been in the job of pulmonary and cardiac rehabilitation. You know, there are nurses that are specialized specifically in pulmonary. There is doctors specialized specifically in pulmonary. They're called pulmonologists. Okay, remember there are different scales, different levels of disciplines in the medical field. Do you know back in the 1900s, 1900s, now I'm not like 1901, 1920, uh, but let's go a little bit, a few years before that. Let's go in 1899, 1901. Let's go around there. Look up a hospital. Anything that is named a hospital was the worst place to go to because it was almost a sure death. People that had the money to pay for a doctor to come out to their home, just do the research. It's, the, it's history. Every, everyone should know what you know, medical history was, you know, how it was back in the day. Back in the day, they didn't believe in gloves. 
you had a person telling them you got to wash your hands because you're going to contaminate this with that other cadaver with this person. So you just worked on a cadaver that was diseased and died from a illness and you're going to transfer that. They call that person crazy. And that person was 100% right. You know, a doctor could have been a doctor a long time ago, but just by being a butcher. Look it up. I'm not kidding. A butcher. Because they were able to dissect and cut bodies open. A butcher. You are our, our new doctor because you were a butcher. Now, of course, they have to go through medical training. Thank God. Okay. But literally, just do your own history. Do your own work. History is a very important part of education. You have to see how things perpetuated watching, looking at mistakes and seeing how those mistakes were being resolved. You know, and that's, that's how we learn in a society. That's how we should be learning in a society. You see, if I'm on three liters of OBG, OBG, OBJ. Oh, that's just a glitch. Oh, it's a glitch. Uh, if I'm on three liters of oxygen and I hook to a 30 for that cord, 30 foot cord, I, am I really getting three liters of oxygen? It's not a bad question. Let's look at it like this. You ready? Let's look at it like this. You have two types, okay? You have what we call a thort tube. And sometimes a thort tube, this would be the knob, okay? And the tube will uh, sometimes be on the side or just on top of it. <coughs> you have this ball, okay? And so you would dial it. If I had the concentrate, but I, I don't. I mean, I have a concentrate in the other room, but don't don't even get them. So basically, I'll turn this knob, okay, to cause the ball to hover midway onto where. And this is like, let's say, this is zero, zero. This is one, two, three, four, five liters of oxygen. This ball. If I hover it over, that's called a compensated thorpe tube. This contraption is called a compensated thorpe tube. It doesn't matter how long of a cord you have, 30 foot, 50 foot, 100 foot, does not matter. This will compensate. So what you would do is you would tie, you will hook in all the, the hoses, and then once you turn on the concentrator, and as soon as you put it on, the ball might just drop. And then you would have to increase the flow rate because of the resistance making it through. It's about Every 10 feet, it drops by a certain PSI, uh, the flow rate, because the resistance going through a tube. So a compensated thorpe tube, that's why it was invented for these long hoses, in a sense. So you would, ink, you would turn, you would dial, you would turn this knob until the thorpe tube ball okay, goes at a 3, and it's hovering at a 3, right? Okay, you don't want it above the three. You don't want it below a three. It has to be right in the center of the three. Some, th some devices are a little different. Some, they want you to keep the ball above the number. Some of them, you have to be dead center. They're all a little different, but the Thorpe tubes works exactly the same way. So if I tie, let's say I, let's say I didn't have anything attached to my concentrator, okay? I didn't have anything. I didn't have any hose attached to a concentrator. I set it to a three. Now I set the thorpe tube, this is the concentrator. I set it to a three. The ball is hovering at a three. As soon as I put that, that hose in there, it'll drop. It might drop all the way down, and then I would have to increase more flow because of the resistance that's making its way through that hose to get the ball back up to three. Once it's there, then yes, even with 30 foot, 50 foot, you're still getting three liters per minute. If you have a different type, like so, if you have this type, which is non-thorpe tube, non-compensated. You have basically an arrow, and then you have a dial. The dial will have one liter, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And basically you would dial it, so if you dial it to a two, then you will get two liters per minute. But with, uh, if you have a long hose, it doesn't know. It doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't compensate for that. So you have a non-compensated, and then you have the thorpe tube, which is a compensated thorpe tube. 
Okay. Just ask your DME company if you're confused. Just ask your your uh, DME company that supplies you with your oxygen to kind of talk about compensated, non-compensated, or what do I do with a long t uh, hose? Because basically, yeah, they should tell you. It longer the hose, the more resistance it gives to push air through that small hose. So you would have to increase. You're welcome. No problem at all. I was told by auction company not at all not. I was told by auction company not to go over 40 foot tube or I wouldn't get good auction because it drops as it goes through pipe. That's what I mean by compensated. You can still have a 50, long tube, 50 foot tube and that's fine, but as long as the concentrator can handle it. Some concentrators don't have a compensation side, meaning that you put it, let's say you put it two liters and you put 40 foot on there or 50 foot it might only give you half a liter of oxygen and not the three or four liters that you wanted. If you have a compensated Thorpe tube, it interacts with that, and that's, how, that's what it's made for. So when there's a longer hose and tubing, you plug it in, you see the ball drop, you would just increase the flow rate until it equals four liters or three liters, whatever your prescription amount is. I hope that makes sense. And told us. I have the first one in told us. Yeah, no problem at all. No problem at all. Remember, everybody, uh, if you go on to mine your lungs, I'll be waiting for you. It's not a problem. If you can't be in a, the HRN program, start in mine your lungs. At least you'll see somebody like me. At least you'll. Uh, at least I would be helping you out. Okay, but uh, I would recommend it. Anyways, guys, that is it. I'll see you guys later. Thank you.